welcome uh, to everybody here and everybody on the live stream. Thanks for attending. Um, this is uh, ArcGIS Online, best practices for publishing and maintaining large uh, data sets. Um, I'm Jeremy, I'm the CTO of web mapping and geospatial web applications for uh, Esri, and I'm here with Paul Barker, uh, product engineer as well in the ArcGIS Online team. And, and Jim Harries, I'm a uh, lead on the ArcGIS Living Atlas team. Welcome. Cool. All right, well, let's get started. Um, so this is gonna a brief agenda of what we're going to cover, um, sort of the challenges of working with large data, um, some of the built-in optimizations that, um, that we do and are useful for you to know about, uh, some of the fine-tuning that you can do, um, and then what happens, you know, once you publish that data, uh, you know, now what? Uh, how do you update that data? Uh, Paul's going to cover views, um, append and overwrite, and editing and data collection. Uh, and a little bit about what's next, and uh, Jim will talk about how the Living Atlas team updates ACS data from the census, because you guys update that every year, like within uh, 24 hours of it being released. Yeah, that's amazing. So I'm excited to hear about that too. Okay, so the challenge of working with large data. Uh, working with large data sets is always gonna have challenges um, because of the general size and complexity. Um, when you start things and things go wrong, it takes longer to respond and recover. Um, actually, working with larger data takes more database storage. Um, and that's an important consideration for those of you using ArcGIS Online and you, if you have a hosted feature service. Um, it consumes more resources uh, when you're working with large data, both on the server and the client, to either visualize, update, or analyze. Um, we can, however, optimize and reduce the challenges by doing a little bit of planning. Um, we'll talk a little bit about simplifying complex geometries in a few slides. And uh, we do a bunch of optimizations, like I said, so that you can get the best uh, out of your data. So the built-in optimizations is that the Maps SDK is both the JavaScript, uh, native, um, and uh, pro, all work with the feature service in a very efficient and deterministic way. Um, they have, um, they leverage uh, repeatable queries uh, that they do so that we can cache things at different tiers. Um, we have a CDN for public access. This is within ArcGIS Online. So you can go viral with uh, confidence. Um, it'll perform well um, with use the CDN even when you're geographically far away from the data source because CDN is distributed across the world. On the client side, you know, we're always, now I'm just focusing in on the, on the browser-based uh, web applications and the Maps SDK. Uh, we do a lot of work to make that performance be as best as it can, whether it's with quantization, um, which uh, reduces the complexity of the geometries on the fly, to working with protocol buffer format, which is a binary representation to make it as small as possible. The Maps SDK only requests the data that's needed. So if you're ever curious, you can check this out in Map Viewer. Um, you're only, it only ever requests the, out, the fields that are needed to do the styling, so the renderer, or the labels. Um, Pop-ups or the fields for that are requested on demand once you've clicked on the feature. And then if you were to go in and say, like, do something, like with uh, pick a field for smart mapping, well, the API is smart enough, just magically goes and grabs that, those attributes for the field that you picked on. Um, so it's a highly optimized, as compared to like the 3X classic map viewer, we always had to request all the fields all the time. So fields that have a lot of attributes would be slower. <clears throat> and we're always um, trying to, to profile and improve, and we may even change our request patterns. We're always optimizing. Um, Multi-scale geometry, I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and then indexes both uh, for fields and full text uh, can be very important when you're dealing with very large data sets. Uh, so what are some of the things that you can control? Well, definitely using the Maps SDKs uh, or the Esri web apps, uh, which use the Maps SDKs, um, that's going to give you the best experience when working with feature services. 
and you know, feature services uh, are amazing, right? Like you get the performance of vector tiles, um, but you don't have the data management headache of keeping a tile set up to date. Uh, we sort of take care of that for you as your data changes. You'll eventually see the latest and greatest without you having to manage that at all. So that's, that's a huge thing. So your information of record can become the layer that you just use to do your visualization, to do your outreach, and so on. Um, uh, the, within the um, feature service page for hosted services, you can control uh, feature search uh, and full text indexes. Um, or, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> with, uh, if you're doing a search into data in your layer, within ArcGIS Online, you can make use of full text indexes. Um, you can also control the CDN settings for how, how long things should be cached. Um, you know, you have to be very careful with editing. Um, when you enable editing, um, you know, you're not benefiting from any of the CDN settings. So be very careful on edit, editing and making that available to the public. Um, if you really just have to, you know, show five million features zoomed all the way out so you see that all, you need to take advantage of tiles, raster tiles from features. And I'll show a little bit about that. Um, then you also need to be careful when using relative time queries, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then we'll talk about the multi-scale and detailed geometry. Okay, just a brief demo here. Um, <clears throat> I've got this data set of uh, census track, so 71,000 uh, features. I updated it this morning at 9.23 a.m. If I go into the map viewer, and I've got, I've got the network tab here, so we'll come back to it, but let's just turn on this layer and see how slow this is coming. Hopefully my network, comes, I was expecting it to be slow, but not that slow. There we go. Maybe the network, but this is good. Let's let these kind of come in. Um, we we'll see some of these these queries are taking quite a, quite a long time. Some of them took 17 seconds. These two are still going, 26 seconds, uh, and still going, almost there. Almost got all that data. This is the first time I've viewed this layer since this morning. So after I viewed it this morning, I made an edit. Um, and then I viewed this layer. Now, if we look at that network tab again, um, this is not a public layer, so CDN is not going to come into play. So there's no CDN access. But uh, there's also uh, nothing that tell, tells us that this is being cached anywhere. This is all going to the database to compute this. Now, let's, let me just zoom in and zoom back out. I apologize, let me just reload the page. I screwed up the demo. Um, but remember I said how we make repeatable queries and that enables caching. So now I'll go back to my network tab, uh, turn on that layer again, and you see how much faster that's coming in. Um, that's because, uh, we'll see things like um, we're hitting the feature tile cache in these query responses. And that's gonna get those times down from 12 seconds, 20 seconds to a few hundred milliseconds in some cases. And so this, this is why when you first view a layer, it might be a little slow, uh, especially for large data sets. But once um, that's been processed once, <clears throat> that cache will be there until you edit that data again. So this is just something that under the hood happens, but you may have noticed that when you're working with a large data set that that first view is sometimes slow and then subsequent views are fast. What's important to note is that this type of caching is not only on my machine, um, it's also for everybody else who's viewing it. So when, if Jim were to load this map, he would see the same uh, performance. Okay. Um, <coughs> last thing here on, um, I mentioned relative time queries. You have to be very careful with those because these are not cacheable queries. Uh, so we cannot um, do any of that caching that I just showed you 
because a relative time query is always changing. Anytime you have current timestamp, which is what you get when you say updated in the last three hours, that time is always changing, and so the answer is always gonna be different. Since it's non-deterministic, you have to be very careful with these types of filters. <coughs> and so you're not gonna be able to leverage any of the caching that we do, and so you're always gonna go back to the database, and so it might be slower. At small scales, there can be too many features to view. And like I said, if you need to display all two million or three million features at once, then um, you'll need to create a raster tile layer. And then that raster tile layer will take it's time to draw a raster tile, and then you can just view it. Sorry, folks. <coughs> We're falling apart up here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so, uh, but you can still, you know, have this kind of like zoomed out view with raster tiles, and then as you zoom in, move to the client side data. So if I go to a, uh, an example here, this is a raster tile layer that I've just cached of all of these cities, and as I zoom in, it's still calling from those raster tiles until eventually I get to the point where using scale dependency, it switches to the feature layer. There we go, now we've got the points there. So that combination of those two layers can help you work with very large data sets where you still need to show that kind of aggregate view. Have two layers and then once you zoom in, switch to the other type and, oh, thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, optimizing for very large geometries. Um, now this is, this is specific to ArcGIS Online, uh, hosting data in ArcGIS Online. Um, but you cannot just store unlimited amount of vertices in a polygon in ArcGIS Online. Uh, it's just not gonna work. And, and by that I mean, uh, this is not something you consciously do. This might be something that happens when you, I'm gonna take a raster data set, uh, I'm gonna compute the pixels that have changed, and then I'm gonna turn those into features. Well, those, those types of, those types of uh, polygons end up being very large and have a large number of vertices. Like we've seen vertices and um, we've seen features in ArcGIS Online hosted services have over a million vertices. That's just not gonna work at all. Um, so you need, to, you need to think about that actually as you're, as you're publishing data in. Now we have uh, some really great tools for, um, for these cases where we will optimize the geometry for you. So what this optimized layer drawing does is it uh, generates multiple geometry columns um, up to a certain point so that, uh, that have reduced quantized uh, uh, polygons with less detail. And when then when you're making that first query that's going to the database, you're always gonna to go to the most, uh, the closest level of geometry. And this is all hidden to you. You don't have to manage this at all. You don't even see these columns, they're, they're hidden. Um, but this is very important. And actually, any, poly, any data set that gets published for a line or polygon feature in ArcGIS Online today, if it, if it has a polygon over 500,000 vertices, or is it 100,000, I can't remember. Something, it's one of them. One of those two. Yep. Um, it will automatically enable this. I think it's 100,000. If you have a polygon that has over 100,000 vertices, it will automatically uh, enable this and build this on the fly for you. Um, and this is smart so that if you make edits to the data, it'll update those geometry shapes uh, for you. So you don't have to manage, manage that. But this is absolutely needed. I mean, even if uh, it could deal with these like 500,000 uh, vertex polygons, there's no client that can edit that. <laughs> so um, that will just crash Pro, it'll crash the web. And uh, I did this test this morning. Uh, the same thing I just showed you with the census tracks. Um, it can improve that initial query time. Remember I said the first time you query, it's gonna be slow? 
Um, if we look at this column here on the left, um, I was seeing times of 20 seconds this morning. And then I built multi-scale on that layer, and then I did it again. And you see all the times were less than a second. And this is even when they weren't cached. And it's for that same you know, view of the US for those 70,000 census tracts. So you can get uh, improved performance, um, initial performance before things get cached by enabling multi-scale. So definitely enable multi-scale. It's 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 the it's it's gonna it's gonna make the performance better and it's going to make things scale better in ArcGIS Online. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about updating data. Before we jump into updating data directly, I want to talk a little bit about hosted feature layer views. For the folks that are in the room, I guess how many people are taking advantage of views today? That's great to see. Uh, oh, yeah. Lots of hands. Um, views are a really um, important pattern for uh, making your life easier when updating data. Um, so we'll talk about some of the explicit uh, view uh, update patterns in a minute. But for those of you in the room that are not familiar with hosted feature layer views, when you publish a feature service, from that feature service, you can create a view. and that view still points to the underlying table or data set in the database, so it's not duplicating the data, but it allows you to give a unique window into that data set. So when you create a view, you can remove fields from that view that are in your, your original layer. You can create a geographic filter to restrict that, uh, that information uh, through a spatial, spatial filter. And additionally, you can apply you know, a traditional SQL filter to restrict it as well. So you've got these three levels of control to see to uh, kind of cover what data the user sees, and then because it's its own independent layer, um, those uh, those views can be configured differently from a sharing perspective. So, um, you know, maybe uh, I don't trust Jim to edit my data, which is probably valid. Probably valid. Right? Wow. Um, so I I could create a view, give it to Jim uh, to make really awesome maps and uh, disable editing and uh, so that I don't have to worry about that data getting messed up. So, um, you know, you can share that data to the public and on, on the left or right hand side here, we've just got a couple examples of uh, kind of some patterns. So you can, you can have as many views, not as many views as you want, but uh, you can have a lot of views. There's certainly some of you probably in the room that are in the uh, hundreds, if not thousands. Uh, I'll say the only th the only thing I'll say about uh, about really large numbers of views is that it gets very difficult to manage them uh, without some level of automation. So um, you know, keeping track of that uh, can be can pre pretty difficult once you get into the, the high numbers. But we do support uh, quite a number of views, so you can tailor them um, for a large large number of audiences uh, and take advantage of that. And there's some really important reasons down the road uh, with some of the update patterns why you might want to create a view. Um, if you're unsure whether you need one, I would definitely create a view ahead of time and start with that in your map, and uh, then it opens the doors for some other workflows. So um, I was just having a conversation with someone at the island about the, the, this specific slide, but we've got a few, I would say, promoted update patterns uh, in ArcGIS Online with feature layers. Uh, and those would fall under three main buckets, overwrite, append, and source swapping. And source swapping is where views come into play. Um, you know, they all have their pros and cons. Uh, overwrite is, uh, I think, you know, from a you know, logistics perspective, very, very straightforward. You delete and replace everything that's there. Um, one of the downsides is obviously that while that's being updated, your data may not be accessible. Um, you can't overwrite when sync is enabled. Uh, and the reason really for that is overwriting is a sledgehammer. And if you overwrote a sync, sync enabled data set and you had field workers in the field, that data now can no longer sync and you're gonna make your life pretty tough. Uh, you're gonna have to bring that data into pro, copy it over manually. Um, and the same is true as change tracking, to be able to um, effectively change, or it, you know, we restrict that to overwrite with change tracking for the same reasons. It could blow away that change tracking history, which could cause, uh, make it more difficult with other workflows. And I guess one thing that's not on this slide, the, you know, the, the assumption with overwrite is that you are overwriting the exact same thing 
that you had before. So if your layer had a point line to polygon, uh, when you overwrite, you, you really need to make sure that it's a point line to polygon. Uh, you got to keep the layer IDs in sync uh, on overwrite, and there's some settings in Pro to facilitate that. And schema as well as a best practice. Um, overwrite really uh, shouldn't be adding fields uh, or removing fields. Um, you can understand you might be referencing those layers across many maps and uh, your user's experience could change if you suddenly deleted fields and their map doesn't display as, as they expect. So, um, and certainly there's some other problems as well. Append is a pretty interesting workflow. Um, we, in the, the kind of front end experience of ArcGIS Online, we call that update data. And there's kind of three patterns of use there where you can insert new records, you can update existing records, or you can do both at the same time. So by providing a, a key field, you can uh, update the ones that match, and then anything that doesn't match will be automatically uh, inserted. And as developers, uh, one of the nice things that you can do uh, in the most recent release of ArcGIS Online is that you do have the ability to kind of pair that. Um, folks today would probably, if they wanted to just delete lay, da all the data and append, they would uh, you typically do a truncate and append uh, as two separate REST calls. The, the append API now has a truncate parameter built into the uh, append workflow, so you can actually do that all in one step as part of the append. Um, one of the advantages to that uh, is uh, we, we can roll the changes back. So, you know, previously, uh, say you truncated the data and you, maybe you missed something in the QA process and you go to append and the append fails and your next question is figure out why did, you know, why did it fail? Uh, right now, your data's, your data's all deleted and the clock's ticking if somebody's relying on that data. So truncate and append together in the same API allows us to roll back the, the changes if there was a failure. So um, should make that, uh, you know, downtime very minimal in case there was ever a problem. And one of the new features, uh, we don't uh, have it in the front end of ArcGIS Online yet, but um, when you upload a data set and use that to append into the feature service, you can now pass uh, a filter into it. So maybe you, you have a status field in your, you know, your GeoDatabase feature class that says new or something like that. You could say, I only want to append the data that's new, that has that field value new. So we've got a little more granularity and control uh, there now, and that'll make its way to the kind of front end of ArcGIS Online. Um, one of the downsides to append, and part of the reason uh, you end up truncating before, uh, before appending, is that it does not track deletes. Uh, so, you know, we have no way of knowing, um, you know, whether fields were added and our features were added and removed between the two kind of the data set you're appending and the existing feature class. And, uh, you know, the other, the other downside is you definitely, you do need a unique index. That's typically not a huge deal, but you do need to make sure that you keep that index unique. Otherwise, there's problems. And the last but not least, and I've got a slide to kind of better, better explain this, is source swapping. So um, with views, you have the ability to um, programmatically, if you want, uh, or through the user experience in ArcGIS Online, replace the feature layer that the view is using. And one of the big benefits of that is that that workflow allows you to publish the new feature layer you can run your QA against it, and I think Jim's going to talk a little bit about this as part of the Living Atlas's update pattern. So you can publish that data, you can visually review it, you can make sure everything's okay, and then when you feel really confident that uh, the new data is exactly what you want, you can use the user interface to swap and point that view. And so if that view is in your map, um, you never need to update your map. You're just updating the data that's powering that view. And so it's a really nice pattern to save kind of overhead of, you know, when you replace a layer, updating, updating every map that uses that layer. Um, and the beauty of that one uh, over many of these other patterns is that there is no downtime. You're not deleting the data. You're not waiting for it to overwrite. It's just a swap, and it's pretty instant. So, um, and if, uh, you know, even if you do all that due diligence for QA, uh, you might discover that the data that you sent you you were sent contains errors, so you can roll back and swap that back to the original uh, feature layer too. So, should you um, should you have a problem, you can kind of flip it back, which is nice. And uh, you know there there's some considerations uh, with with sync as enabled, but technically it is supported. You just need to be mindful of it. Um, and much like overwrite, we expect in this scenario that the sublayers of the view must match the same sublayer IDs as the uh, as the, the new layer, and uh, the at a minimum, the, the new source layer needs to contain all the same fields 
used in the original view definition. So schema can, it's got a little bit of flex there, so you can add new fields, you could remove fields, and as long as those aren't being directly used in the, the view that you're swapping into, you're, uh, you're good to go. And uh, one restriction that they do have, though, is if you're doing the tiles from features, um, you, you can't have that and use this swap because that will force some of the tile regeneration, which consumes credits, and uh, so um, that's a restriction on the views. But conceptually, uh, this is kind of what it looks like, uh, which is probably better than me just talking. So I've got my original source feature layer, I've got my hosted feature layer view, and that's being used in many maps and apps. And uh, what we do is we disconnect or wire up the new one and disconnect the old one. And so um, once that's done, that source feature layer, uh, you can archive it, you can export it, you can keep it around just in case, but you've got the, that, that flexibility. So. Those are some of the, I would say, the bulk update patterns. They're all quite performant, uh, but uh, they get, depending on your needs and what you, what you kind of have to achieve with your workflows, you can integrate whichever one makes the most sense. Paul? Yep. Just before you go on, there's a, there's a question here. Uh, I think it would be good. I've noticed that uh, overwrite breaks widgets configured in dashboards. So we end up deleting row by row and appending, which makes a ton of calls to the server and takes a good bit of time. Can you read that again, sorry? I've noticed that overwrite breaks widgets configured in dashboard. Okay. So we end up deleting row by row. Okay. Uh, and then using append, which takes, uh, makes a ton of calls and takes a good bit of time. So I think, I would think there's two, two possible, there's two things on this one. Yeah. One is the overwrite actually should not be breaking if you follow the rules like Paul said. I think, yeah, definitely, it shouldn't really, there shouldn't be anything that breaks there that I'm aware of, but. Yeah. I, but you do have to, in pro, make sure you're reusing the same ID. Absolutely, yeah, That's that can be a step that gets missed sometimes, and then, uh, yeah, everything gets confused. Yeah, <laughs> and then for the uh, penned workflow, well, yeah, you should never delete anything row by row. That's yeah, definitely not. not that's that. not a good practice. Actually, you'll probably get, you get somebody from Esri calling you if you're doing that on an online hosted service, because <laughs> um, that's definitely painful. Um, <clears throat> do you want to talk? To, you want to answer that one? Yeah. So I mean, d you know, for deleting features, the delete features REST endpoint allows you to pass a you know a query or a where clause to do batch deleting. So maybe if you, you know truncates uh, will delete everything, but the delete API you could pass a filter to make a single REST call or a handful of REST calls to remove what you what you don't want. That would be the strategy there, I think. Yeah. Or if you just need to blow away all the data, yep, truncates. Use the go. truncate REST API. Yep, truncate works great for yeah emptying the data set for sure. Cool. All right, uh, we're going to touch. So that's that's kind of bulk updating. I I, I just want to touch a little bit too on editing and data collection because that you know sometimes that's a huge part of data management. Um, you might publish a data set in the field, or and take it out into the field and. Uh, or edit in the web, and so there, there's a lot of advancements that have been made in our uh, in our editing story over the past year. So, um, you know, in ArcGIS Online, we now support snapping. We can edit attributes and geometry. Um, we have rule-driven uh, attribute collection through Smart Forms uh, via Arcade. Um, and I would say one one cautious thing, um, you know, we see, you know, everyone's uh, I would say credit and cost conscious these days. Um, you know, when sync does have overhead, uh, and when you, to, to successfully sync, we have to track all of the edits that you make or your users make to the service, which does take up storage space. So um, my general advice here is if you don't intend to go offline, don't enable sync if you don't need it. It will, it will increase the storage size, and depending on how many edits it can add up, however, um, it, the other alternative there is if you do need sync and you still um, want to kind of manage some of that space if you're doing a high, high degrees of edit, we do have on the feature layer item page the ability to trim that tracking history. So you can trim it, I think, 30, 60, 90 days. As a developer, you could go to that REST API uh, and trim it to whatever you want. Um, the thing that I would say there is that, that if you're trimming it, um, you don't want to trim further back than whenever the last person who are people who are offline haven't synced. So if, you know, Jeremy's been in the field for 60 days, don't, don't trim it to the last 30 days. Otherwise, his data will not be able to sync and he'll be pretty unhappy. <laughs> um, so definitely uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, you know, sync does have an additional storage cost for good reason to be able to manage and s fulfill those workflows. Um, and one of the cool things with smart forms is that we can reuse those in field maps in both connected and disconnected uh, 
scenarios. And uh, the, uh, I'd say, think about, you know, when going offline, um, I would say we constantly get requests uh, for us to increase our limits on what you can take offline. Um, but uh, the least amount of data possible is my general advice. Uh, taking you know, 15, 20 gigs of data offline in the field uh, is, is a challenging scenario. It's challenging to sync. It's challenging to download in low connectivity environments. So um, set yourself up for success. And I would say the general temptation is, oh, I'll just take everything off and it'll be fine. But like that can, you know, if you've got 2,000 people in the field trying to download all of that data in, in remote conditions, it can really be quite, quite difficult to be successful. So, um, try to scale it back, and uh, additionally, you know, we have premium feature data stores uh, that allow you to get more compute power in the database. Uh, so when you're doing, you know, lots of high high frequency editing or lots of synchronization and offline use, um, that's something uh, to consider. Uh, there's tools inside of ArcGIS Online that allow you to manage uh, our visibility into your database resources, and then you know, keep an eye on that and ad adapt as needed and upgrade if you need to. And uh, a few pieces of advice for uh, exporting and backing up data. There is some built-in options into ArcGIS Online that allow you to export uh, data into various file formats. Uh, we, like almost everything where possible, we have some smart caching so that if your users are all making the same request to export data, we're not actually doing work in the database, we're reusing uh, cached exports. Um, Create Replica is the API that is used under the hood when we export data. And that is a very flexible and rich, sometimes confusing API because it has a lot of options. But that gives you an, a, an enormous amount of control to just export the data as well as support offline use. So if you just want to export the data uh, using the Create Replica API, you can set the sync model to none. And that it really just dumps out a copy of it. And so that allows you, you could do specific filtering. You could only export one out of 10 layers. So it's really got a lot of fine grain control. So and works. Um, there's less moving parts with really large data sets. So if you've got a 10 gig feature service that you want to export and maybe you're running into some issues with the, the export button in, in online, it's, uh, it's worth looking at the create replica call. All right, and with that, I will flip over to a couple of quick demos and then hand it over to Jim. Um, so we talked about uh, append as a, as a pattern for up, updating data. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna start with the view. So um, in the user experience, uh, this is a hosted feature layer view. Uh, I'd say the data set isn't super noteworthy, but um, I'm gonna go into the update view uh, definition experience and just show you folks where this is and just walk through a little bit. So we've got swap source down here at the bottom. So this one's met the requirements for basic source swapping. And so if I click swap source here, you'll see there's a, a lot of guidance uh, here about what you, what, what, how, what the layer should look like. Um, you know, they should have the same layers and tables. Uh, they should have the same IDs and things like that. As you can imagine, if we just let you swap one data set out from underneath the view, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, so it's pretty easy to, uh, you know, if we didn't put some guardrails on this to, to to break your data set. And so that's something to keep in mind if you're scripting this general pattern. Um, so for example, if I was to go to road closures here and try to swap this uh, line layer uh, into my point layer and I click this, um, our user experience is gonna do a series of checks. So it looks at it and straight up, the geometry doesn't match. So that's a non-starter. Um, but if I was to go down and maybe find a, a point layer, let's see if I can, yeah, some stores. You'll see that uh, you know the geometry in this particular case matches, but the you know the fields are nowhere close in this in this particular example. So we warn you and tell you. So there's a lot of checks and balances in place in the user experience to prevent you from accidentally making a mistake, and uh, that is you know the ability to swap sources is something that we're looking at doing. Um, directly in the Python API in the future and building in those same checks and balances so that you, uh, if you wanted to automate a process like this, you, def you wouldn't have to have all the awareness uh, and write all that code yourself. So that's something we're looking at um, for, for a future release. I was chatting with the Python folks this morning. So just one more quick little demo and then I'll hand it over to Jim to tell you about some cool, cool stuff in the Living Atlas. Uh, so I'm just gonna touch base a little bit on the update data workflow. So from a feature layer page, you can click update data. 
And kind of these are the, these are the four options uh, available to you. So you can add features, you can update features, and add and update features. So this, I think this time last year, uh, it, we, uh, this, this feature didn't make the Dev Summit release. So we showed, uh, kind of showed a screenshot of it. But um, so this is, this is now in the uh, ArcGIS Online and in Enterprise. And it's got an updated user experience that brings in quite a bit of new functionality here. So I'll just add a layer really quick and just talk about a few things. So I've got an Excel sheet. Um, and uh, it has a series of Excel sheets. So um, one for every coordinate type we, we, uh, we support. So I'm going to pick the one that says lat long. Uh, but, or actually, sorry, I'm going to pick the one that says address. Uh, and previously, uh, with append, it only worked if with CSVs and Excel sheets with XY data, or uh, that was, or basically just appending into a straight up table. So we've expanded what we support to kind of closer align with publishing. So if you're appending data in, um, we can geocode that on the fly as part of the append. If you have MGRS coordinates or US National Grid coordinates, you can use those in place of lat long. So there's a lot more options now to, uh, about how you derive that geographic information from files like CSVs and Excels. Um, additionally, uh, <coughs> we've tried to kind of make the field matching a little uh, a, a much better experience. So there's now more visibility into the field types when you're matching them and, uh, and whatnot. And if I go back, uh, let me just pick a different layer to show one more. Uh, Let's go to the lat long layer, because I think it has dates, if I recall correctly. So, yeah. So, um, you know, when you publish data, um, you know, when you're working with data dates in ArcGIS Online, typically you're in UTC. That doesn't mean that this random CSV you grabbed from, you know, the US Agricultural Department is, uh, is in UTC time. So this allows you to specify the time zone of the source file that you're appending data into. And then we can adjust that and store it correctly in the database. So this, this was a feature that was missing in the old user experience, but now you can do that uh, and, and explicitly set the time zone that the data is coming in so that it gets converted and stored correctly and all your data lines up. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's it. So lots of options through the UI. All of this stuff can be uh, scripted in the Python API as well. Um, and we're always looking at new ways, but those are the general patterns to kind of update data. And you know, to some extent, it doesn't change whether it's large or small data. Um, the best practices are still the best practices. So with yeah. that, I will hand it over to Jim to talk to you about how the Living Atlas does this all in real life. <laughs> oh, nope. one. that's not gonna work. All right. Cool, thanks. As a member of the Living Atlas team, I'm one of the people who thinks about what is flashing on the screen right now. What are we going to get out of this data once it's hosted? And if that's a good thing, if we can get, for example, this is uh, air quality data for the United States at the census tract level. So if we could do this once, how can we do it at scale? So everything that Paul and, and uh, uh, Jeremy have talked about, it catches my ear because in our process, we're always thinking about the information product that's going to come out of this. And if we can do one good information product from a layer and the layer has 200 attributes, what do you think I'm thinking about? I want those other 200 attributes put to work, don't I? And if there's 200 layers possible, well, I'm thinking about that as well. We think about how these layers are going to end up as web maps or part of dashboards. Um, we think about how we're going to share the information on how we build these things through videos and blogs and learn paths. But it all starts with the layer. And so I just wanted to share, they invited me to share two examples from Living Atlas. Um, in addition, uh, has, if anyone's used live feeds from Living Atlas before, it was one of the original users of the layer swap. And uh, I remember when I got certified to use the Python script to swap a layer. <laughs> When it was made available in the JavaScript API and Paul Dodd made me certified, I could use the Python to swap a layer, my first layer, broadband layer. It was awesome. I was like, OK, I'm in. And then I found out you put it in the user interface, so I wasted my time. Um, not really. It was great. Two examples. We've been working for a while. Census American Community Survey, for the past six years, we've been doing an annual update every December. Um, they release it to their Census API. And because their API is so reliable, the census data in the US is so well structured, well documented, well thought out, we're able to go and 
get all the tables we want and all the geographic boundaries we want, grab them, merge them, do a bunch of uh, value add to them, and turn them around within 24 hours. And we update that all in place because six years ago we didn't have view swapping, right? Layer swapping. So compare that to Census 2020. It happens once a decade. Uh, we got the data last year and we were able to use a view on that and that's the pattern we're going to be using going forward. Just a quick thing, typical ETL process. We're gonna extract some data. We're gonna transform it. We're gonna load up a layer and go. We're gonna make our first map and then we'll start to learn some things that we should have extracted the first time, but we didn't. You know, this is a very, anyone ever followed this process in a manual? You know, the first time you do it, you're like, okay, I think this will be right. And then you get it, everything in place and you find out, oh, we need one more field. And the typical example for, I'll use census. You know, the census in the US is really good at producing counts of things. And people who want information about the census, they like percents or rates or ratios or indexes, indices, I suppose. And so this chart kind of talks about, hey, after you get that first map done, that's your first opportunity to start finding gaps between what's in the schema and what you really need. And thank goodness for Arcade, because it solves a lot of schema sins. Right? The sins committed upon the schema will be passed down to all the children of the schema, won't they? Right? But Arcade, it like magically makes that problem go away, at least temporarily, but sometimes permanently. But anyway, I digress. When you find a gap, like in my example here, our dashboard needs to rank the neighborhoods by the percent of population with low income. But census only gives you a count. So you have a choice. You can do it in an arcade and solve the problem. Go look up the right denominator, by the way, to make sure you get that right. But the question is, is every GIS user in the world going to have to solve that same problem? What if I put it in the schema? Like, when did we decide schemas were sacred and you can't touch them ever? You download them and thou shalt not change them. So we try to think the other way. What are we going to add right from the start? And the interesting thing, as we started to transition, I mean, our workflow is always do it manually first. We're doing this right now with some SDG data. We're gonna do this manually. It's gonna be painful. It's gonna be brutal. And then we're gonna get it up as a layer and then we're gonna show it to somebody and they're gonna say, what about? And if that's not already in the schema, the tendency is to be like, oh, well, that's hard. And um, yeah, you start dodging and you know, no, 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 no. We wanna flip the model to where all questions are welcome and everything you want, how can we do that? Once you kind of learn the pattern of, okay, we need some percents, we need some rates, we need some indexes, it's a pretty repeatable pattern. It happens over and over, project after project. When you add automation, the good news is everything these gentlemen have showed can be scripted. And so we, this was the big surprise to me as a, like a, a manager of the effort with these ACS projects is I suddenly realized, we have an opportunity to add value every step of the way of the ETL process. From download, how many records did we download? 52 states or 55, whatever the number is these days. 3,141 counties, 72,000 and change tracks. Okay, that's what we downloaded. How many are in our, our uh, file geo database right now? Same number, good, that's a good start. After we join it to the geographic file, how many do we have? Same number, good, continue. Uh, we hosted it up to ArcGIS Online. How many features do you have? Same number, good, we're all good. But we actually got to a point because of what uh, Pend allows, we're actually able to check every value of every record in every table. And that turned out to be a big plus as far as assuring users, this is the exact same data as if you downloaded it from the census yourself. So this ETL process through the scripting of the append and other operations actually allows us to add a lot of value. Complex slide here, but it really gets down to this. Everybody does this at the start, um, frequently joining geographic data to tabular using tools. This next column, the value add column is where we strike. We try to improve that schema by adding some calculated fields and documenting our calculation in the field description. Did you know field descriptions are available in ArcGIS Online? You can write a whole paragraph, you can write a sentence, you can provide the formula you use to calculate that uh, variable, that attribute. And then using the best practices, whether it's append, uh, overwrite, whether it's all the things Paul talked about, whatever makes sense for your situation, now you can continue to add in value along that way through 
um, the update scripts that we're gonna talk about here in a second, we even use update scripts to update the web maps in place. And therefore, when it comes out the other end, all the information products that were already pointing to my layers, now I just have to do one final human review of them to make sure they're all good. So our data planning works like this. We are considering for ACS, we'll probably continue updating those in place because we started it six years ago. We've got a pretty good following on those layers and it only takes 24 hours for us to get them updated. We could switch to a view approach, we might. There might be a business reason to do that. But like with the census, the 2020 census, once a decade when it came out, we switched to the uh, view approach for that because we value the idea that anyone could come to us tomorrow and ask for a change and we're willing to make that change. These are some of the questions, I, I put this in for your reference, I'm not gonna speak to all these, but these are the kind of questions we ask when we're trying to plan out the schema at the, at the start. And we actually put a person in the middle of this, um, in our case, it's, her name's Diana, uh, and she's here at the showcase, but I guess the showcase is over today. Yep. Um, anyway, we take all this input on the left side of the screen, our subject matter expert knows the ACS technical DOM, documentation, knows where to go get all this information. How am I gonna pull all this stuff together? And creates these assets, usually spreadsheets or other documents that are inputs to the right-hand side of the, scripts, uh, the screen. All these scripts on the right-hand side add value. We define what is our master metadata gonna contain? What's the name of the layer? What's its description? Um, what are the field names, the alias descriptions? Um, what additional fields do we need to calculate and how is our automated QA going to occur at every step? So we define what tables we want, we define what additional fields we want, and literally we will use the information here to some form of it, copy and paste that into the field descriptions so that it's very apparent this is how it's gonna work. And what I love about this approach is it's manager proof. I can handle filling out this spreadsheet for my team. Right, I can fill out the metadata. This is kind of the pattern we wanna use. And as a result, if we decide later, oh, we missed that one field wasn't quite right, we'll run the script again. We'll get an update in place. Um, for me, automation has been a high ROI investment. Uh, you know, like I say, our pattern is do it manually the first time and then start to figure out how to script it. We're in our sixth year of scripting the ACS update. This year it took the least prep time ever and we ran it faster than ever with fewer, I don't think we found a single bug or issue with the results this year. And that's a testimony to just persistence. We are going to look through the log files. If any little burble occurred, we're gonna kill it in the script the next year. We have some of these resources available. Um, our, they're roughly grouped into updating the layers, working through a defined schema, that our metadata expert created. And then we QA every single field along the way, as I said. Screenshot of the actual upsert. But not only that, we also invest in cartography and pop-ups and labels. And it was very important to us not to lose that investment. This was a requirement. It wasn't a requirement the first or second year, but uh, we figured out how to ensure we could do a quick update to the cartography on the fly, and it worked. And then lastly, we also update the item page. Everything circled in red is an attribute. Anybody remember WordPerfect and mail merge? That's basically what we're doing here. I heard you laugh, there's one person. That's great, but that's what we're doing. We have a template, it's driven by a spreadsheet, again, that a manager like me can handle. And everything is logged so that we can notice any little problem with our inputs, our outputs, um, anything inconsistent upstream of us, or even if uh, there's a little burble in the uh, internet and our job just didn't finish, we can detect it and improve it. Track it all in a spreadsheet, and that's how you end up with 144 census layers for roughly the same level of effort it would take to do two or three or 10. So the benefits, I'll leave, these, leave you with these. These are some of the benefits of scripting and automating, what Jeremy and Paul talked about. All these are available to you. You know, manual methods are great for prototypes and small projects. Script, when you wanna work at scale, to me, scale means 10 layers or more. Um, the schema changes used to be difficult unless you think about all the downstream impacts, but 
Now we have an attitude of schema changes are welcome. What do you need? You know, there used to be a tendency, you get one chance, I still know teams, they get one chance a year to touch the schema. And then I walk in and say, hey, would you be interested in having two week turnaround? And they're like, uh, talk more, yes, we're interested. And that's very liberating, I think. Um, the manual methods, um, people tend, I'm guilty of this, to make a minimal effort toward hand editing field aliases and descriptions. Anyone here love to do that manually? So if you can offload that into a spreadsheet and find people who love to do it, um, yeah, then we can do these changes anytime. And the other benefit is instead of heavy QA towards the end, right before release, now we're able to QA at each step along the way. And as we all know, catching an error earlier is far less expensive than catching it late. Um, and the biggest benefit I appreciate as a cartographer is the, the idea that we can script all those updates into the cartography and pop-ups themselves. As a result, we feel very confident that instead of having to plan things out one year ahead, for some things we do same day service, but for significant changes, let's slow down. Let's take about two weeks to do it. So I've got a couple of links in here, and that's the end of my section. Um, but we also may have some questions you want to highlight, Jeremy. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Tim here, uh, for the Living Atlas Census ACS and similar, do you bring the metadata along? And are there tools and or guidance for delivering the metadata along with the item information and layer? Yeah, it's a good question. What we do is we create these spreadsheets that we kind of cherry pick what information from the official census metadata and documentation we want to pull. So we're very sacred about, we treat the field names as sacred. We treat the um, field aliases as sacred pretty much. Anything we add, we follow in the form of what the census has done, and the descriptions are literally copy-paste from census. Um, and we find that to be a good pattern. It's a trust-building thing that uh, tends to pay off. Okay. Um, here's another question, um, not related to metadata, but uh, do spatiotemporal feature services like GeoEvent, Velocity, et cetera, generated layers share the same optimization features that we talked about er earlier, and how do they differ, and what do you gain when using them with large data sets? Um, well, lots to unpack on that question. Um, GeoEvent uh, and Velocity, you know, they also have a socket or a streaming connection where they're pushing features to the client, and that's a totally different ballgame. Um, now, uh, Velocity and GeoEvent will build up these spatial, tem um, these, uh, big data feature services that load lots of uh, observation data and keep a history of it. Uh, that also happens if you use, let's say, location tracking capability of, uh, within online. And those are different types of databases, right? Those are more, um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, uh, oh shoot, I'm drawing a blank. What kind of, uh, uh, what's uh, elastic, elastic driven, uh, you know, as an example, elastic driven feature service or things like that. Um, those things are actually, there's a lot of similarities, but they do behave fundamentally differently. Um, on an elastic big data store, it's actually not good at giving you lots of data from it. It's good at giving you uh, a, an answer, uh, a summary, an average, an individual feature, and really fast, but not good about pulling uh, 600,000 points out. Um, so I think they're, you know, they're for different use cases. We've got two new questions here. And just to call out too, with uh, Velocity, you can also create views. So just keep that in mind. Uh, there's an experience to do that, and the same user experience that I showed can update views. And then um, we don't want to just take questions on the online pigeonhole app. So if anybody here has got questions, come up to the mics and uh, just ask away. While you come up, Paul, you said you could have many views. How many views can I have? <clears throat> I, you don't have to commit to a hard number. Yeah, I, I, you, certainly we've seen users use thousands. I would say that's a, definitely a, a unique wow. situation, but you really have to be managing that through automation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would say you know, 20 or 30 views could go a really long way in terms and yeah. be, still be quite manageable in the user experience. But uh, I think there are some other limits in enterprise. I forget the exact number, but enterprise does have a number of limits on a, a number of views per service. Um, 
for questions. Here you go, Jim. I think this one is for you. Uh, aligning the census geometries with the current Esri network base map. Is that something done behind or they're not aligned anymore? What about aligning the census geometries with the current Esri network, network base map? I think if you're in here, you should come up and uh, talk a little bit uh, with Jim on that one. Make sure we understand it. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to understand that a, a bit more. Okay, if no other questions, thanks all. Oh, here's one. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if you guys have ever considered change detection. It's something that I've done with big data sets before for clients, um, not wanting to overwrite the entire thing. We're talking like millions of points in a layer. Um, and I was trying to use a change detection workflow beforehand and then only passing the changes. Definitely had some difficulties doing that though. I mean, it certainly comes up. Um, I think, you know, there's an opportunity to do some of that with the new filtering. So being able to, you know, flag the data that's changed now in your data set, and you could, you could do that. I, you know, the deletes are obviously a little bit tricky uh, without comparing every row to every row. So it's, um, you know, I, I don't think there's any immediate plans to make it work in a similar way to sync. Like, it, that's a very difficult problem to do, but uh, it, it is something that comes up and we discuss it periodically, but no, no immediate plans, that's for sure. And one thing I'll observe, our live feeds methodology, if you Google Living Atlas live feed methodology, Living Atlas live feed methodology, there's blogs that discuss kind of what you're talking about, because for our live feeds, we do have a need to detect changes in ups, things that are upstream of us. Like we're trying to understand, is that like a real deletion or was that an error in communication or things like that. So there's some interesting scenarios and discussion in those um, resources. One question, um, uh, Paul or, or Jim, are there new truncate append script examples available like for Python? Um, good question. Uh, no, uh, not that I'm aware of, but that's something right. I think we can take back to the, to the, and work with the Python API on to get, uh, get some better, like newer examples. Um, those REST APIs are pretty simple. Like you just pass a where clause in your delete uh, yeah. or just call truncate. Yeah, truncate, truncate is super simple. Trun truncate yeah. is just, but uh, the, the append API does have quite a bit of, quite a bit of options to, to toggle. Okay, I don't there's see a, any more. Oh, there's, there's someone coming Wait, like, oh, 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 oh. It's a race. More. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, Go for uh, it. The few layers, is, um, is there any plans to not have them be specific to hosted? Feature layers? Uh, no. The question is, um, you know, non-hosted view layers. At, at this time, no. There's no. There's no pattern for that. And you know, enterprise, uh, you know, not ho non-hosted services have have kind of a similar ability where they can just publish a a new feature service that still points to the same underlying table in the database. So there hasn't really been a, a strong need for that. Uh, and uh, we kind of need the database access to yeah. the view properly. So it's not like you could bring the enterprise service into online and then we create a view from it in online. Um, so no, not, not at this yeah. time. It's really just like a database view, something to think about. So it really needs to be in the same database. Yeah. Okay. Um, apologies. Um, I'm sort of newer to Esri products and software. Um, so sorry if this is sort of an easier question, um, but I was wondering, because you were talking about um, appending data to um, a service, and I was wondering with views, is it at all possible to um, create a view based on um, like some sort of date appended or by append sets themselves? Um, I, a great question about uh, just driving a view based on data updates. And so we do have the ability uh, to enable what's called editor tracking. And so as features get added, that information is persisted as a timestamp. And so you could do stuff like that uh, where you, you know, event-based filtering essentially based on that date time that the features were updated or replaced. So there, yeah, there's some capability there to do that. Okay, perfect, thank okay. you. Yep. Hello. Um, you talked about automation with views and maps and associated products. Are there examples on a GitHub somewhere? Examples of the automation of maps? Yeah, of like the scripts of like, you know, just like a... 
You were saying the, the Living Atlas uh, live feeds and blog posts, right? Yeah, that's a good place. There's some of those live feeds. I, I seem to recall we have put shared some things, but you can, anyone interested, definitely email me, J-H-E-R-R-I-E-S at esri.com and I'll connect you with the people. I think some of the scripts, you know, it, it just kind of depends on what the map is you're interested in because sometimes, you know, we get really down into the weeds of this, like census data, how we do that update is very, very different than how we absorb information from several uh, wildfire agencies and synthesize it and bring it all together. So at some point it goes from kind of general concept to, oh, now we're, now we're down in the weeds of this particular implementation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we don't really publish, you know, I don't have all our census scripts published because they're so specific and they're all wired up with some of what we chose to do. Mm -hmm. We haven't really backed, stepped away from it to say, okay, what would you want? So that's why it's a good reason to email us and say, I'm, I'm, here's what I'm doing and do you have anything? Okay. Cool. Thanks. All right, we're at time. So thank you everyone and uh, have a good time at the party. Yeah. <laughs>